fantastic. Well, here we go. Stephen, thank you very much for joining us on Life Behind Bars. You are actually <laughs> you. the first person who is joining us overseas. So this is going to be very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Grateful for you asking me to be on this uh, podcast. Seen the past two episodes and they were absolutely awesome. So it's going to be a good time for sure. Uh, that's great. Thanks a lot for the support. And, you know, again, reasons why we got you, you know, you're not just a, a bartender, but you do very good in flair, you know, checking your Instagram post. And not just that, you know, what kind of brought us to kind of get you part of this podcast was how passionate you are. And I think we share a lot of things in common. And it's like we were discussing about this yesterday, I think, which was we have, you know, every bartender has different opinions and it's all about sharing those different opinions. So again, right. a big thank you for joining us. And um, I think let's just get straight to the point. So what kind of got you into the whole um, bartending thing in the first place? Well, we're back a little bit over seven years ago. Um, so I had a friend of mine who did uh, the initiation course from EBS in Barcelona. And okay. it was like just a, a local friend of mine from the area I was living in in Belgium. And he came back, brought, brought back like a shaker and a bottle, had some like small tricks he learned on the course. And at that time, it, it, it piqued my interest in not in such a way that I was like hooked to it. But uh, I just like uh, tried it out a couple of times and it felt interesting. And I think about two weeks after that, I met with uh, Christophe van den Abelo, which is also a professional flat bartender right now. And he was like throwing around four, five, six shakers uh, at the time. And I was like, it, it amazed me. My mind was blown when I saw that. So I remember when I was talking to him, um, I, the first thing I actually said to him when I saw him was like, how many girls do you take to bed every week doing this? And he, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, like, and it's like that broke the ice instantly. And because I wasn't working at the time, he wasn't either. He just moved across Belgium to where I was living. And from that moment on, I was like, yo, let's uh, let's try this. Uh, let's train together. And we've trained together for five, six months before he moved to England. And it, it really got me a good base into flare bartending in general. So that's where it all started for me, just straight up meeting Christoph fairly straight in the beginning and then going from there. I just kept the motivation up and I've been pushing ever since. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I think that's kind of how a lot of us started is there was always this kind of person who kind of like inspired us or we just found was very cool. You know, for me, it was actually uh, one of my teachers and I was probably 16, 17 at the time. Mm. And um, when I was in year 10 to year 12, you, I was doing uh, catering and bartending in high school because uh, you need to pick a course to finish high school. And I chose that, funny enough, as a backup because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And then when it was year 11, we changed one of our teachers and I had the professor Victor, the same name as me. And he was the first kind of guy that gave me this kind of bartender vibe. You know, he had the beard. Uh, he had, a, he, had he, he was the first one to show me a few flair tricks. And he just kind of showed like how cool it could be to be a bartender. So I think we all kind of meet on that one person. And then, you know, eventually, you know, we take inspiration from that person. And then after that, we just kind of, Again, we, we start to be ourselves and show how yeah. we act and how we perform. We try to but find yeah, a way. Yeah, it's good. We, we we try to find a way with the basics and and go from there. I think I evolved myself into a flare bartender, which first of all, thanks to in, the entire community that I have because they do support me a lot for it. Uh, it it was a heavy road to to get where I, uh, where I am right now, but uh, I do really yeah. for the time. Because people told me, like, yeah, you had lessons from Christoph in the beginning, but you have such a different style than he does. And that's where, where we get back to, like, every bartender just has their own things that they actually personally evolved into. And that's what also piques my interest. Sometimes I look at other people being like, yo, this guy is really good. But then again, they're like, yo, man, you're insane as well. So keep pushing. You know, it's what motivates and drives us to just become better every single day. Yeah, exactly. I think... With flaring, you know, it's such a beautiful art, part of our bartending lives. And, you know, I think everyone will do a little trick from, you know, spinning a napkin. But then when you kind of want to learn more and more and, you know, like yourself, you're a flare bartender. And one thing, being surrounded by a lot of flare bartenders at times, it's amazing to see like how hard you guys fucking work on it. 
you know, because uh, a lot of you guys could have your bartending jobs where you're doing 40 or 50 hours a week. Then you got a day off usually when you should be resting. And you guys are like, no, fuck that. You just go to the park and you're there for Every hours weekend. and hours. And uh, I had a very good friend of mine called uh, Emilio, which he used to work with me behind the bar. Um, and he kind of got into flaring as well. And then, you know, we one time we just met um for a drink and to go and do flaring and there's me just with one bottle trying to do one trick and he's yeah. with you know two three tins and he was just hours non-stop and he was just so focused on it and then i took a break after like 20 or 30 minutes and he's just yeah. just keep going <laughs> but That's yeah I, I think um when you go also ahead. when we're doing the fair competition so Emilio like he done his first fair competition and this is what I'd like to ask you about um when you guys are you know practicing all these moves and then when you have like a competition or you're just recording your own segment how does it feel and how do you kind of prepare yourself for that oh I think to every bartender that will be different uh, to me personally I've done a couple of competitions like and I speak, I'm talking about like five years ago is the last competition I did. Um, but how I prepare, for example, to record my videos is like, I just go with the flow. Either I'll probably be flaring for about an hour, something like that. And I'll find something, a sequence that fits with me because I freestyle a lot. So I used to practice sequences that were routine based when I was uh, still doing a couple of competitions back in the day. But then over time, that, that changed into a more freestyle way of flaring. So when I feel like, okay, this is something that that actually captures my interest to try that specific sequence, I will try to record it. But even while I'm recording, I might actually upgrade it like small little bits. I might add a bump or a tap somewhere. And just like the final result, when I, when I landed, I, like I had a, couple, a video a couple of days, maybe last week ago, Took me like three and a half hours to to land it, but I was so focused on getting that specific sequence out there that it just kept me running. It was pretty cold outside, but once I landed it, I was I was it was a relief. It just felt like a weight dropping off my shoulders. I can record it, I can edit it, drop it to the community, yeah. get the love, give the love. You know that's how it goes. Yeah, you know, and it's just so nice to see as well when you know a lot of bartenders are posting their videos and you know especially flaring, because flaring is really one of the most beautiful things to see um, part of our bar community. And, you know, they'll see that three-minute clip that you've done, but then they don't really realize that probably took hours and hours to do. And the behind-the-scenes of it, you know, how many swollen fingers do you have, how many broken bottles, how many cuts. But then it's that entire effort, which is kind of like actors, you know, they they're acting for, like, 200 days just to get a one hour sequence and that's kind of what it is with flaring as well i think you would agree with me on that yeah i, th I think we be can both relate that we've been at this point where we were trying something specific whether it's for i for flaring or just like anything behind the bar and we've been trying to practice it for so long and we even get frustrated i had moments i was crying like a little kid just like i got this i know i, I got this and then finally to i have these people asking me like yo, do you ever drop or break bottles? And most of the time I will reply, like, I'm not a robot, you know, I'm just a, a human yeah, being exactly. like everybody else, you know, Picasso didn't became Picasso, just making one painting, you know what I mean? Or doing what he does. And it's it's crazy to me, like some people asking that question because if they sing, like they are not like Ed Sheeran from day one, one it's, it's insane. But at the same time, I understand where they're coming from. We're not robots, we're just human beings. I've broken a shit ton of bottles. I've I've hurt myself. I had cuts, bruises, uh, bottles on the head. You, you name it. You know, it, it, the list goes on. And I think that's for every specific thing that people want to get good at or great at. Let's say um, they'll have that struggle and that hardship to to just improve those tiny bits because in the beginning it will go really fast, but then the curve will flatten out, and you just have to really put in that time to to make small improvements. And and that's what how I say like separate the wheat from the crops, right? So um, I think it's really about the dedication you have for the thing that you do, whether it's fair bartending or anything else. I think uh, that's the most important part. I like doing fair bartending and, and you do like bartending and doing bartending in general. I see so many people just go hard. It motivates me. It gives me energy on a daily for sure.
no doubt. Yeah, no, yeah, I think you're right. You know, we um, people don't kind of recognize that. You know, we, in order to do it right once, it had to go wrong a hundred times. You know, I think when I started, for example, you know, we'll see a, a bartender, you know, like make five different cocktails at the same time, and they're like, "Wow!" And then you know, I took a while to do that, and I was quite a slow learner, so I'd make sure I would try and try and try until I got it right. And, you know, you could be a bit dismotivated at times when, you know, for example, something that took me two months to learn, all of a sudden this bartender learns it in one week. But, you know, everyone's yeah. different as long as you keep putting the effort in. And, um, you know, a lot of people, especially when I think I uh, moved back to this restaurant where I was working and um, when I had to go behind a bar and make cocktails and they're like, wow, you're amazing. Like, you've been in this for a long time. And then they get they feel so bad when they're making mistakes and i'm like look you're not going to beat me when it comes to making mistakes the more mistakes you make the better you are as long as you get to learn from them that is really really important and when you also kind of mentalize that you're human you know mistakes are going to happen um you can't just always feel bad or beat yourself up with it that's you got to accept it but the most important thing is learning from it and I think as well um, with the new, I call them post-COVID bartenders, is, you know, it can have to do a bit with this uh, generation, but you got to, you know, you got to accept criticism as well. I was very heavily criticized when I started uh, bartending in Portugal. And it was quite surprising when I kind of moved to back to London. Um, in London, you know, you do get a lot more appreciation from your work. But it didn't mean that you were treated badly, like when I was in Portugal. It just it was that tough love that would kind of make you improve and just keep you on your toes, keep you stay humbled, make sure you're not a show off. Yeah. You know, my first bar team, they were like, I was the youngest. I was like eighteen at the time, and the youngest after me was like twenty seven or twenty eight, and then the rest were like all in their forties and thirties. So. I was very, very bullied, like really bullied, but in a good way. And they really helped me be comfortable and kind of show that bartender personality because, you know, we, we, we're probably the biggest jokers in hospitality bartenders. We love to joke around. Facts. Facts. I think, I think for me as well, it, it has been a similar thing for me um, where I ended up most of the time being either the sole bartender because here in Belgium, most of the times we don't have barbacks. So we don't start as a barback. You start as a bartender, you do anything. You do whatever a barback does, but you're bartending at the same time. So you need to combine whatever you, you, you guys in the UK split by two. But you most of the time, I think in the UK, it's like high volume. Everything is high volume. I've been working behind long bars. I've worked at a couple of salsa bars, which was pretty nice. That's, I think that's the only place, a salsa bar I was working in, where I was working with multiple bartenders. So most of the time, it was my own bartender. I was just doing things by myself, following the, the menus. I'm, I'm not a mixologist. Like, I'm not super knowledgeable when it comes to, like, mixologist uh, mixology and stuff like that but over the general line most of the people that i worked for were super happy with uh, what i did try to keep everything neat clean and just get the orders out as they came i, I think it also like made me in such a way that maybe i want to work with like maybe multiple bartenders and high volume and stuff like that that's where i uh, turned into like doing events super hype thing for me to do um especially here, here in Belgium, we don't have that too much. Like flare bars aren't even really that much around in, in the area. We have like a, maybe four flare bars in the entire country, which is so weird because when I look at other places on the world, like Italy, UK, Spain, etc., it's like really like every street corner in between brackets again. But, you know, like I would like fit better in that type of environment where I can just be like going out and go to a flare bar here, here I basically need to take a hundred kilometer drive to, to see a flare bar in there, which is sad at the same time, but it's good. I'm trying to do a competition next year. It's I'm doubting myself whether, which one is going to be, but at the moment I got my eyes on Zante flare open in Greece, which is going to be oh, nice. super awesome. Weather. Um, to me, I think first, we're gonna have a good time. It's gonna gonna be just good vibes. A couple of days being there, enjoying ourselves, having a couple of drinks, you know, just having that good vibe. But for me, at the same time, it makes me really nervous. 
even though I've been flare bartending for such a long time. And I'm not talking about the competition because the way I look at some of the people being in the, in the flare bartending professional league, let's say, like to me, they're, they're my idols, my, my pioneers, let's say, in the scene. So I'm always in, the, in this mindset where like, how can I compare to these guys? You know, they're just in, insane, you know? And, and I've been, I couldn't see myself doing anything else in my entire life. I know I need to work for society, but if it comes down to it, I would only do bottom for the rest of my life till the day I'm crippled. No doubt about it. So, and I think, like you said, being that family vibe where even though they might be better or not as good as you, I don't look at, that, uh, at it that way, but they really push. Uh, as I, like I have people being like, yo, you, you're really good. I like your style, stuff like that. You know, I see you, man. I'm like, keep going. You're grinding hard. You have a nice flow even though maybe they don't like it's just day one let's say but i just try to to push them to become a better version of what they are at that specific moment and i think for all the high uh flare bartenders being at competitions doing the same thing for for me or or a lot of other people is just what keeps me from actually doing flare bartending i wouldn't want it any other way to, to have that motivation and that dedication it's like out of this world you don't see it in any other community i uh, any other uh, community like, yeah but still i completely agree i think but like, i'm still kind of trying to find what exactly type of position of the bar that i really enjoy working and you know i've done quite a lot of it but to be honest i think to this day the one that gives me the most satisfaction is actually uh, the managing side of the bar because I think it's the influence you get to have. And I don't know, I just felt great, you know, you being responsible for the entire of the venue, you know, just from the bar side and then from the customer side. Because when I kind of got into the management, for me it was, okay, you're throwing a party and people come into your house are people you've never met. Now, you want to make sure it's a great party. So, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to be on the door and you're just saying, yeah, it's five pound entrance. Come inside. Like, no, you know, have a laugh with them, have a joke. And then when you get to go downstairs and see how things going, you know, talk to a few people. How's your night going? You know, I'll go to the DJ. How's everything? I'll go to the security. Like, what do you think of the music? What do you think? Uh, is anyone having a bit too, um, being a bit, dangerous you know you kind of get to worry about the whole aspect and that's what gave me probably the most satisfaction and also when you get to also develop bartenders you know it's a great 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 pleasure when you have someone who asks what goes inside the gin tonic and then before you know it a few months later they're making a espresso martini and a groni and mojito a long island iced tea and a boulevardier all at the same time and then my favorite thing is when you get bartenders actually that are very shy and they don't really say a word. And then three, four months later, they don't shut up, <laughs> which is great. I was exactly the same, you know, and it, it, that's why I think it's very good as well. The bartending, your confidence just has a really big boost. And um, yeah, I'll just say, just don't, don't be afraid to make mistakes and just have fun. That's all it is. It's the, it's the mistakes that, that will get you where you want to be. If you don't make mistakes, you're never going to learn, you know? So even for me, like, I, and that's a, that's something really personal to me. Like, I'm not shy about it at all. Like, I've struggled with social anxiety for such a long time. That's also why I haven't done competitions in such really battling that aspect of my life. So, yeah. and m me as a medium, having social media to put myself out there and stuff like that, and getting all that support back of, of me be making consistent progress, let's put it that way, it's like, it just filled my heart. I know I know that even though I'm battling this and I had flare camp just in, in October that just passed and it took me a long time to, to manage to get the courage even though COVID was in between. But aside from COVID, it took me a long time to find the courage to go there. And when I arrived there, I had spoken with uh, Tom Dyer and he was like, yo, man, yo, just give it a rest. Don't stress about it. You know, like, just come over here, you know, like, uh, have a good time. So I went there and absolutely was amazing. I think it's one of the best weeks I've had in uh, in my entire life, no doubt. And yeah, well, just... what, sorry to interrupt, but what year did you do the uh, flare camp? Was it? Yeah, I did this flare camp. Oh, was it this year? Okay. I did flare camp. 
So, and, and just being there surrounded by 40 other bartenders on different levels. And it, it was just so amazing because after I, I separated ways with Christoph, let's say, because he was going to England, I proceeded doing my flare bartending in the way I was doing it. it. It felt like I didn't have anything to prepare with besides the people that I idolized. So when I came to flare camp, it was like, okay, you know, like, I'm actually maybe not that bad as I thought, because like I said, I'm my hardest critic. It's always going to be like that. And I want to keep it like that because it pushes me to do better every day. But when I came there, I'm yeah. like, yeah, maybe I'm not as bad as I, as I thought I would be. And now getting all that support from people from Flare Camp and from the community, like, oh man, like the love. I, I could basically, honestly, like when I speak about Flare Botting in such a way like I'm doing now, my, my, eyes, my eyes just twinkle. You know, it's like, so passionate about it it's and you as well and uh, Atos and other people coming on first of all on the the podcast and seeing so many people doing their thing it's just like I, I couldn't get enough of it ever period <laughs> yeah exactly no and this is why you know i was saying to Atos you know he doesn't really look at his following but you know I mean look at yourself you've got at least 2,000 people following you and then you got videos with thousands of views and I said like you know you guys don't realize how many people you got into this industry and probably someone who was a bit shy of posting their videos but then they're seeing you post your videos and you know it's a really great thing to see and I, like I say you know I, I absolutely love the more bar videos out there the better and like you say you know you being your harshest critic it is really important you know when I finish work every day I finish work I used to always think I didn't do a good job and um even stuff that I used to finish work, and I'm like, oh, did I do this? Did I do this? Or did I remember to do this? And then I'm like, have these little anxieties every day when I finish work. Because for me, no matter how much I've done, it was never enough. But when you did have days that you know you've done a good job, but you always think you could do better, but it's the satisfaction you, you get from it. And, you know, like you say, you know, you've probably worked hours and days and weeks and months on this segment, and then you release it on, you know, your social media, and then it so excuse me all of a sudden you have this person who just comes up to you and said oh look what you've done was just amazing and then you check their social media account and then you just see them getting started and you know you, you don't have that thing that oh there's another one trying to be a flair bartender you know you're looking at that like yes that's another one part of the group that's exactly what we need yeah. and like the that's what group. i love about us yeah exactly so you know I think it's a really great thing that you're doing here, Stephen. And, you know, a lot of uh, you fair bartenders do, which is just, you know, you embrace the community, which is absolutely amazing to see. And uh, I hope to have you here in London one day as well. But what, what, where, where do you see flair bartending going now in the future, like three, four, even five years from now? Ooh, uh, that's actually a really good question. I think I have like one specific route that I do want to take. Um, and it might be a little bit different than than other people. For me as a flare bartender, I would like to generate passive income streams and become a digital nomad. So, which means for the people watching, um, I want to travel the world, earn income let's say 80% of online stuff that I would be doing, whether it's giving masterclasses, giving lessons through video calls, um, making tutorials, social media, uh, merchandise, just name it, just to, to name a few aspects of what I would like to, to get myself really like incorporated into. Um, income that's enough for me to travel the world so I can do guest bartendings and teach other people on location. I shouldn't I, I don't want to feel restricted to one specific area of the world. Like the world is so big and Belgium is so small. Yeah. You know, I just want to be traveling and at the same time I want to feel like I've put in time to teach either the next generation something. It, it doesn't matter what it is. It could could be anything else, as long as I feel like I had a purpose doing it. And I think that's the main line for me, the, being able to travel, related to bartending maybe, because that's what I love doing and I'm passionate about, and just um, gets other people into what I'm passionate about, you know, what we as bartenders are really pa passionate about. I think that's the main thing, like that, that, would, uh, that would be the epiphany, for sure. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, do you know, I think that's a really nice thing you said, and it's quite true. So, uh, uh, like, I don't know if you had it in the last podcast I done with Sam. That I said, where do you think the future, you know, of like bartending is going to be? And uh, he said something that I disagreed with, which is uh, he said uh, that's well, he says worst case scenario, which could happen, that bartending might no longer be a job that is enough to pay the bills. And I completely disagree with that because. Our job is actually one of the oldest professions in the world, other than prostitution, maybe, you know. Uh, but, um, you know, I think the minute, you know, a caveman wanted to get something and he had, like, water, and then, okay, give me a bit of that meat and then I'll give you a bit of water. And that's already a bartending, you know. He was free pouring yeah, yeah. from day one. Um, but, yeah, so I think that's a true thing. And I think, you know, the bartender personality, the bartender vibe is growing more and more. There's this page I follow on Facebook that they post every day. And it's like a bartender from the Philippines, bartender from Indonesia, bartender, you know, from Greece. It's just expanding so much everywhere and around the world, which is really great to see. And I think now when we kind of approach the future, more and more bars what i like they're no they're no longer that mainstream like each bar has a different vibe to it so i was with antonio last week he's going to be on the podcast uh this is absolutely amazing he's a bar manager right now but his knowledge is just ridiculous and like what i love is like nice the menu guy. sorry <laughs> He looks like a super nice guy. I've seen his uh, profile. He has like four posts. So yeah. He looks like real professional there. Yeah, he's like a bar legend, to be honest. And he was showing me the menu which he created where he works. Um, and it's like based on a theme. And this is what I kind of love about these cocktails on these bars. They have these themes going through that it's no longer you choosing the cocktail. It's almost that like the cocktail is going to choose you, which... To explain to people that kind of understand it, it's like you're not picking the cocktails of now the ingredients you like the most. It's the cocktail that you're picking now is the one that feels more like your personality because now cocktails in a lot of places now have a story. And again, you know, there's a cocktail for everyone. You know, it's been going on for years and years. And in a 100 years, there's always going to be new cocktails, which is really good to see. And it's not just, again, the cocktail part of the bartending. It's you just going out. And this is a great thing as well. It's like you don't need to drink alcohol or just make alcoholic drinks to be a bartender, you know. I know a lot of people that don't even drink and they're bartenders and they're bloody good at what they do. So, you know, it's something that's just open and accepted for everyone. And a lot of countries, you know, like in the Middle East where they prohibit the sale of alcohol, but they got very good bars there as well. So it's a really good thing to see. And I think as well, like, you know, we all kind of got that inspiration, you know, from the film Cocktail by Tom Cruise. And yeah. I don't know if you feel the same, but I kind of feel like we need to get another bartending movie coming out, you know. Uh, it's been yeah, a long actually, time. we do. We do. Because, like you said, the film Cocktail with Tom Cruise, that's like, uh, it's an iconic movie. Let's just put it that way. And to maybe make a new iconic movie that would be like refreshing, let's say, like the new era, let's say. I think yeah, that exactly. would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, one thing I really enjoyed about the movie Cocktail, which kind of as well, you know, I, I, at least it's how I kind of felt it in the beginning when I got into bartending, you know, I remember there was a scene where Tom Cruise is, uh, you know, they're working in the bar and they're all having fun. And then this old guy goes to him and I forgot the other name of the guy. He's like, I want you two working for me. And then they go and they work in this amazing bar and then they're having a great time. And then after that, you know, Tom Cruise is trying to find a way to like make a lot of money and be super mega rich. But then when the film draws to its ending, you know, he doesn't care about the money. He just wants to be happy. And, you know, he finds the one. And then the way the movie ends that he just goes back and he has his own bar, which doesn't make much money, but he's just happy there. And I kind yeah. of feel the same as I do right now with that as well. So when I was leaving my previous job, you know, I was having a conversations of my my bosses trying to get me to stay and we were discussing money and I said I don't really want to make that much more money that I'm getting now in life and he kind of laughed and he's like trust me you're going to always want to get more and more money uh, and that is absolutely not true you know I think that I, first, I right? tend, 
yeah, I, I turned down a job which basically was going to double my salary. And, you know, it was very tempting and it would have helped a lot of problems I have in my life because, you know, as we said yesterday, all, all bartenders are broke, to be honest. But yeah, <laughs> it, it also kind of made me say, like, no, let me go through a few more struggles. You know, I'm only 25. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, we need to make mistakes going back to, you know, what we were talking about. So I think at the end of the day, we kind of really need to just be ourselves and like you say we want to find what we want to do and you know there's so much out there in the world that we kind of will get the opportunity to do exactly what we want to do and i have no doubt that you're going to achieve what you want to achieve Stephen, because you know your vision's very good your passion is all the way there and that's why i had you on the show like watching you talk watching you post stuff it's like that's a that's a real fucking bartender right there which we really that the whole world needs to see so that's one that's point me. to it that yeah. it's very important oh man even like honestly like you saying that just touches my heart man really it does like yeah. i've been yeah. putting in all this time and like i said getting all that love back and be able to give it back in in any form of way i do it i'm never gonna stop no doubt no doubt it is just like thank you man <laughs> no no problem I forgot to, because I know we we I know what you're drinking, but the people at home don't. So I'm having a lovely plantation, which is the last drink I had actually with uh, Samuel Poxon on the last podcast. And you've got a very fancy bottle. If you want to show everyone what you're having, I do got some Dalive vodka, which is a Swiss brand, by the way. I, it's made in the Bordeaux region of France, but they get sold out of Switzerland. So basically, the backstory to it is like wow. the name derives from Dali and Eve Evelyn. Um, and they combined the name like this is a very smooth vodka, forty percent. It okay. is. It doesn't have like a really heavy punch to it, but it's really smooth. I advise you guys to get one because, uh, yeah, man, they're really tasty. They're really, really great. I've been sipping on it for for a few days now. I opened this one, and yeah, it goes down really smooth. Doesn't have like a a hard punch to it. I enjoy it very much. Yeah, for sure. That's good. Yeah, this is uh, my first drink I'm actually having in a while. Oh, I mean a while. I mean like four or five days. Um, you know, I don't really get the sense of drinking at home unless you know just a beer on occasion. But even that, it's rare. Yeah. But to hear a funny thing as well, sometimes people, you know, like from a customer's point of view, you know, we love our customers, but you do get customers that really don't understand our jobs. And I, I, I went to this bar and I just saw the most, I heard the most horrible thing ever, which was apparently these girls were sitting on the table and it was booked. So there were bartender or manager went to them and said sorry we have a booking coming in 15 minutes you know just give you a heads up and then they're refusing to leave and mm. they're making a bit of a scene and then the manager goes downstairs and he's not english he's foreign and then these yeah. customers go to him and they're like oh where are you from you're not from here you're foreign and then all of a sudden they're going to him as like yeah you know it's because of us that you have a job and he took it really well to be honest and then eventually he gets yeah. the girls outside and they say, yeah, it looks like Brexit didn't really work when it should have. And then she said, well, we spent £80, so thank you, because now we got to actually help you pay your bills. And then he goes to them, he's like, oh, thank you so much. Now I've got money for groceries today. But you do have these kind of terrible people at times. But then, you know, you do get nice people that will make it up for it as well. But, you know, we're just, I think a good thing as well that, got me more as well into management is the confrontation i'm a very agreeable person so and i don't like confrontation but when you have to deal with it and you know one of the hardest things ever is to tell someone that they have to leave because they drank too much and mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand why we do that because they're like why are you doing that you know you're making money with me it's like the goal of you going out is for you not to get smashed the goal is for you to have a good time we don't want you to wake yes. up the next day forgetting what you've done with a massive hangover and regretting it so saying why did i spend this so much money you know we don't mind you having a little bit of a headache but you know oh yesterday was really fun it was worth waking up a few extra hours later than usual and you know you look at your phone you see all the pictures you had you know that's what we look for when the customers go out I don't is, know, is, how, is, how's the yeah, how's the lifestyle with Belgium? Ooh, for, I'm I'm really honestly I'm a really bad person to ask that thing about because I'm like same as you. I don't really drink a lot, so just very occasionally, and oh, then I do, I'm but... like, yeah, okay, but you know, I like 
I don't drink a lot, a lot. Like for, yeah. I drink on holidays, you know, like Christmas and New Year and maybe my birthday and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm not really an, a guy that goes to the club or I don't go to bars a lot. I've worked in bars and I've drank there, but it's not like a, like the scene. It, it really depends. If you go to Antwerp, which is the biggest city in, in Belgium, let's say, I've lived my life, really nice city. I, I advise everybody, if you're in Belgium, go to Antwerp. So, um, no, they have clubs. It's it's really outgoing, but it, it's not like the UK. The time to go party, let's say. In, in the UK, that's that's at least the stereotype I go from. In the UK, it's like the bar opens at, let's say, five. And then yeah. at six or like seven, it's like already packed with people, let's say. Really? Wow. So, yeah. So and here in Belgium it's not like that. It's it's more or less like people will do a pre-drink at their house, maybe leave around eleven or midnight, go to the club, go to the bar, you know, and it, it just like it, the the intensity of the night it it builds up gradually. Like in the beginning, it's just very oh, okay. when you're thing, and around midnight, one o'clock, everybody's like pouring in, and it's really like going six in the morning. Um, especially like in high volume bars or in nightclubs, uh, they really have that type of vibe to it. It's not like when it opens up, like a, an hour or two later, it just because the way I see it when when you spoke to me about the UK is like you will be going home at at one o'clock. You know what I mean? Like yeah. And it, but that's when the party like in, in between like eleven thirty, twelve o'clock. That's when the party like starts here. You know, like so. <laughs> For me, it's the same thing. When I do go out, it's probably going to be around midnight that I'm actually going there, doing some pre-drinks at a home party or anything like that, and then just go there, drink some cocktails. Even at a cocktail bar, I would like go later on the evening. I'm I'm not an early bird when it comes right. to that. No, that's quite interesting because, yeah, like you say, here in London, you know, around six or seven, if it's a busy day and everyone wants to go out, the bars will be full. And, mm -hmm. you know, Belgium's like Portugal, you know, it's like, you don't go out at 10, you know, if you get that midnight, that's kind of the time you're aiming for. Um, yeah. And then it'll go on until 6 a.m. And that's because, you know, as well here in London, a lot of places have a 3 a.m. license. But um, mm -hmm. no, that's one thing that's very true. One thing that's how, so the story of like how people in London drink it, it's quite intense as well, because like our, we have cocktail bars that will open from midday and they'll be full already. And, you know, brunch is a big thing here where, you know, they get bottomless drinks, but a lot of stories. So like your typical group of Londoners going out for drinks is they'll probably meet around three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And they'll probably go to do this brunch. Then the brunch finishes at six o'clock and then they might get something to eat, but it won't be like a main course. It might be some sides, right. but they're still drinking. And then mm -hmm. they're okay, let's go out to this bar because happy hour's finishing at eight o'clock. And then they're drinking, and then yeah. it's eight o'clock. And then in those two hours, they're just, you know, having cigarettes and talking to people. And then it comes 10 o'clock. And then from that 10 a.m., sorry, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m., they're just like going hard on even more yeah. drinking and more <laughs> partying. Cool. And yeah. then if there's another after party then well look what's going to happen with that after party mm -hmm. they're going to go until 6 a.m and then get home probably at eight o'clock so when you look at it they've been drinking and partying for like 14 15 hours hardcore it, which like, is yeah, that's really hardcore man i could not do that honestly if i would be yeah. drinking for 14 or 15 hours i'd be dead by midnight man <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know i've had better times with it but yeah it's true it, it can get quite a lot and i think as well you know you i I've, I've been out a lot and you like i always mention this podcast you know be at once one of my favorite places to go to but it's when i'm looking back and see how much money i've spent on it and i'm like well do you regret it after all that money i'm like not really because it kind of made me who i am today now if you're going out and you're regretting it then that's a problem but if you're not regretting what you're doing then that's absolutely fine so that's one way to look at it as well um but to be honest, is I think, you know, everyone when they go out, they have this own personality. Um, but now it's just to change the subject. One thing I was going to also um, speak to you about, which is we have a lot of different bartenders, as we discussed. So what do you think 
is the difference now between a pre-COVID bartender and the difference between a post-COVID bartender? How do you think they are different? Ooh, it's actually a really good question. I think for me, I did uh, I did the uh, pre-COVID bartending, and it, it's I was still building up to becoming the person that I am today. Uh, I personally think that it just felt like a job. It felt like a job. I think pre-COVID, it felt more after COVID because having all this time where we couldn't work here in Belgium, we had a lockdown for 14 months in total, which is insanely long. Um, yeah. I was working at the bar when I wasn't working at the bar when the first lockdown happened and I was working at the bar when the second one um, occurred. So I was like giving government pay afterwards. Uh, the second lockdown ended. I really felt more like I wanted to connect with what I was doing beforehand. I was just like working and not really thinking about it, just being passionate about flair attending um, in, in general. But after that, I was really like, I, I really want to get more into it, being more service uh, focused, you know, service focused, being there for the customer. I had this period of time. I think everybody had this period of time where they were like disconnected from the world so badly that we actually wanted to have that connection again, as a, even though it was yeah. as a bartender, we, we just wanted to connect with something. And we as bartenders, we connect with either the people at the bar and the bar itself. So I think post COVID bartenders are more into it than pre COVID bartenders, just in general, like their passion has leveled up from being here and going straight up there and being like, yo, I gotta put myself out there because if you go on a lockdown again, I'm gonna be missing this stuff. So that's that's how I look at it, at least. One thing I did really want to ask you, which is um, something that I've kind of got a bit more um, familiar with a lot of bartenders, especially over the last over the last year, which is, you know, a lot of people consider us bartenders to be very social and extroverted uh, personalities, which I am quite an extrovert myself, which means, you know, I gain energy from being around people um, and introverts lose energy being around people and it's funny how a lot of bartenders are actually quite introverted and they have to deal with a lot of anxieties of having just to deal with people. So I'd like to ask you, like, because you do consider yourself to be quite an anxious and introverted person. So how do you kind of really deal with that? Uh, the, the thing, how I actually dealt with it is like, I tried to get my focus on the fact that I wanted to deliver excellent cocktails, which I'm not a mixologist to give me a recipe or a menu to follow, I want to put it into detail. I want to be like, the garnish needs to be really good. The composition needs to be really good. I just wanted to be very strict when it came to me as a bartender, managing the bar. It would be orderly. It could be messy, but I would like fix it straight away. It's like it's some type of OCD type thing that I was dealing with to cope with the anxiety that I was having. I had moments where... um. People would try to talk to me and I just didn't felt comfortable with it. And people notice that's the thing with an introvert. Uh, introvert. I have conversations and sometimes it just go very smoothly and, and I don't have any issues with that. But I have other conversations where I'm like, what the fuck am I even saying? You know what I, what I mean? So I think it, it builds up over time. Um, it's, it's something you just got to push through. I've had five years of battling my anxiety and from point A to now, let's say the present day being point B, is that I needed to overcome to be where I'm at. People perceive me on social media as a very extroverted person because I'm so passionate about what I do. Behind the bar, I'm more like, I'm on this side of the bar, you're on that side of the bar, but that doesn't mean there will be no conversation. I know as a bartender, I have to do the things that I have to do. And like you say, for me, it's like can like a, getting a soda out of a how do you how, how do you call these things in english oh fridge uh, fridge getting a soda out of the machine out of the machine you know like put in a coin like i would like yeah, yeah. every time i have a conversation would we'll put like a coin into the machine receive the conversation i get the conversation going expand the coin i have five coins for the let's say i have five coins for the entire evening I expend the coin yeah. by the end of the evening. The night is over, the shit is over. I don't have any coins left. I'm depleted of energy. That's how it feels for me. But as long as I'm on the job, 
what is necessary for me as a bartender. I think that also made me me to to put it that way, you know, like it made me a bartender that that wants to be me. I think a lot of times when I was working in the bar, I didn't felt like I could be myself where either because I don't come across like a very, very confident person behind the bar. Firstly. Yeah. So most of the time people would doubt my experiences or the things that I've learned, et cetera, whether I'm certified or not, it wouldn't really matter. They would just be like, oh, you have a couple of years of experience, but then they would ask me questions about like making menus and stuff like that, ask that information, but then not implement anything. And I felt like really bad about that. It didn't really help on the anxiety part because I was just like, yo, I know that I can do this stuff, but it just doesn't it doesn't radiate from me like some extroverts do. They'd be like, oh, they're all over the place and people really connect with them, which gives them an edge. But towards the service, I think whether it's an introvert or an extrovert on that on that level is the same. The service needs to be really yeah, good. 100%. Whether, you, whether you are a chatterbox or not, it doesn't really matter. The service needs to be on point. If you're just very professional with it and you're like, enjoy your drink, have a good day, you know, like enjoy yourself and just tend to go back to the uh, to the bar or whatever, or they're sitting at the bar, or you're a chatterbox and you'll be like having this entire conversation about whatever. I think in the end, it all comes down to how they perceive you as a bartender. You need to be feeling yourself and the client will perceive you as that specific person. It will give you that that thing that makes you you to them yeah to the client no i think that's a very very interesting point I, i'll tell you what the way you said as well about the coins which is kind of like your energy marks that's very very interesting to hear because i've known a lot of people that quite like that as well and you know i've worked with the most extroverted and introverted but they're kind of like you say as long as the service is there it doesn't really make a big difference and i think when we we're always caught very introverted when we start like a new job, for example. So I remember like when I joined my first cocktail bar um, and the manager working there used to go to the restaurant where I was working and just get coffee. And I asked him just to see how I was working and how I can improve. And he's watching me work. And, you know, I was like my first day. So I'm very shy. I'm not really talking to anyone. And yeah. um, we went for a drink afterwards and I was like, okay, so what do you think? Like, what can I improve on? And, he went to me, he's like, well, the way you're working behind the bar, I didn't see an issue with it. The thing you need is confidence. And it's interesting because the confidence he was talking about wasn't the confidence to be loud and just talk and talk and talk. It's just having confidence in what you're doing. You know, it's grabbing the shaker with like confidence. It's shaking the cocktail with confidence. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could be introverted or extroverted doing it. So I think that's also quite an important step you need to go through. And I think when as well, you know, with our anxieties, you know, like we mentioned previously, you know, I get it. My anxieties really come from thinking I didn't do a good job. And when it, when you do get praise, and I don't know if you feel the same, but right now, before when I started, I used to be quite... um I'm trying to find the right words like I wanted to get praise for the job I done because I wouldn't get much praise for when I started in bartending and I kind of was always dying to hear someone saying to me that I'd done a good job and now when I kind of get it and you know like I've had people come oh you're the best manager I've ever worked mm -hmm. with or you kind of don't know how to react to it and mm -hmm. I do kind of get this I don't know it's it's this weird feeling you get. I mean, it's nice to hear it, but you just don't know how to react to it. But I think it's also depends on what you're getting complimented on. So if someone's going to compliment, give me a compliment about my flair, it's like, well, that's because you haven't seen flair bartenders. Um, but yeah, you know, we kind of have a, like anxieties at work. And, you know, it is very difficult. And I think also when I talk to a lot of people that, you know, like you and me, we kind of found of what we would love to do for the rest of our lives. And when you meet a lot of people that are still in their 20s, they could be in their 30s or even 40s, and they still don't know what they want to do in their lives, which is absolutely fine, you know. Like everyone's got their own time for things. But sometimes people think that you just, when you wake up, you want to be a bartender. You want to wake up at 7 a.m. and do this. But in my experience is, 
not really the whole time, you know. I remember when sometimes I would be working in a bar and it's something that I did want to do, but I didn't have much motivation to do it at times. So there would be times I remember I used to just like get my headphones and then put on my phone motivational videos just kind of pump me up to do this, you know. And I think sometimes when people do discuss and they talk about their experiences, you know, some of them can be true, but a lot of times it's like, I hear people say, and it's like, yeah, I always wanted to do this. And I was focused a hundred percent and I was doing this until five in the morning and then wake up at seven in the morning. And it's like, I don't think you're being a hundred percent honest. And for me, the problem with that is then people who want to kind of be like you, they think that this is how you should feel the whole time, that you should always feel motivated, that you should always feel, it doesn't happen. You know, you need to motivate yourself a lot. You know, like mm -hmm. I, like okay example like thursday i was feeling on top of the world you know really happy with what i was doing and then on friday i really felt really really low um and i didn't really have reasons to but i just felt very very down and you know i think the whole world needs to kind of realize is that you are not alone going through this and you know to the point of the anxiety as well it's a lot of people will say you know oh i can't do this i have anxiety and it's like you're absolutely right but everyone has anxiety now you kind of need to see it's can you battle through it can you push through it or are you just always going to try and be the victim because if you're going to always yeah. try and be a victim it's really not going to work out for you and not at all i think for being me the victim is terrible. i think um like i've been struggling with anxiety and i have this this most i a motto that i really enjoy hearing like if you if you tell yourself you can't, you're right. If you tell yourself you can't, you're right. You see where I'm going? So it's, yeah, it's all yeah, about exactly. it's it's all about how you perceive. I, I'm like I've said to myself a million times, like I cannot do this. This, this, this. We make so many excuses as to why to we I why we can't do specific things. But at the same time, if you like change the psychology on that and you'll be like i can do this because this 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 and then you like pinpoint yourself towards towards where you actually want to go no matter what it is then you actually start over time and like you say it's not every day some days i'm, I'm really depressed let's say i'm really depressed i don't know where to go i don't know how to act etc and other days i'm super energetic and people are like you're not introvert at all which yeah. i get but every day is is no challenge to just put yourself out there. You don't have to. I think like people should take it as a grain of salt. Like sometimes you just take the entire canister of salt and you just be like, yo, this day is my day, you know, and I'll just take the entire box. But other days you just have to be like, yo, you know, today we'll just nuance, I, I just make a nuance and just take a pinch of salt, you know, like. Um, but mm. yeah, like you say, you know, you got to take it with a, a pinch of salt and it's. You know, look, it's like life's tough, man. It is difficult. But then, you know, and I was talking with this as well to go like about happiness. You know, people think happiness is like you just wake up happy and you're doing everything happy. And it's like a lot of time happiness is by expectation, but happiness comes in short like periods of time, you know, and that's the time you've got to kind of be looking for. And a lot of times it is expectation. You know, if you go into work, well, so not work, but like you say, you want, you go out with your friends and your friends hyping the whole thing up saying, Tonight's going to be legendary. We're going to be doing this. You're going to be doing that. So all mm -hmm. these expectations are right up here. And then when you go into the night, because you didn't hit those expectations, your happiness levels drop. But if you just have someone says, yeah, we're going to go out and we'll just see whatever happens, those really turn out to be the greatest nights. You know, That's why a lot of times your best nights are the ones that are not planned. Um, but as well, like going forward, um, I think you know it's something that we all got to deal with, not just bartenders, but everyone else in the world. And um, I think, you know, we'll all find a way that we can achieve it. Oh, sorry, I got you back now. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like it comes. Not you. But yeah, look, uh, Stephen, so I'm really happy to have you here and I'm sure we'll get to have you back very soon as well. And I hope to, maybe I'll go to Belgium or you'll come over here. Um, but before um, I get you to do your own things, have you got any advice for the fresh upcoming bartenders, words of inspiration before we lose you? Word of inspiration to all the new bartenders trying their first bars, their first uh, events, their first play bar experiences like that. Don't overthink it too much. Just go with the flow. 
be consistent, try to build yourself up from point A to point B, but just take it as it comes to you. Don't push on it too much. Just be consistent on a daily basis. Don't put 24 seven of your time in it. You still got a life to live. And that's the best advice I can actually give it. Enjoy the process. That's that's the best advice for me personally. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I think we could leave that there. Well, look, for everyone's been listening, bartenders, thank you very much. And just a big reminder, guys, remember, if you ever want to get through your busy days or you're just very tired, hungover, you've got your lovely gold river, or you could even have the lovely Dalev. Uh, how do you pronounce it again? Sorry? Dalev. Dalev. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You got Dalev. And if you want to get some Dalev to do your own events, guys, the mercenaries bartenders, which will take you to do any event you like, link will be in the description below. And if anyone wants to any apply donations for our podcast, the link to my PayPal will be below. And again, Stephen, thank you so, so much for doing this. And um, hopefully we'll just get more people like you into the bartending world and um, hope to have you back again very soon. So thank you for everything. Guys, been life behind bars. I'll see you on the next episode. See you on the next one. Thank you for having me, brother. Peace out.